and the tree movers to relocate a beautiful beech tree. West Coast reporter Bob Smaus is in Tucson, Arizona to visit a show place for desert plants and animals. It's called the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum and will harvest leeks for Marion's recipe. All that is just ahead, so please stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants, available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. And by Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Peter's professional plant foods and potting soils for all your indoor and outdoor gardening needs. Our first report today comes from Bob Smouse in Tucson, Arizona. You're looking due south, 60 miles further on and over those hills, and you're in Mexico. But the luxuriant vegetation here in the foreground is part of the collection at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And we're here with Mark Dimmitt, who's the curator of plants. Mark, what's the mission of this museum? Well, we exhibit here live plants and live animals, but not separately, but integrated into naturalistic exhibits. And we cover a four or five state area, 120,000 square miles, and they're assembled here so that you can see a large part of our region in only 15 acres. So you're gonna save us a lot of driving around. We hope so. Well, great, can you give us a tour? Sure. What have we got here, Mark? These look like prairie dogs. Yes, prairie dogs are one of the commonest animals of the desert grasslands of the Southwest. This looks like just a big pile of dirt surrounded by a wall, but it's not that easy to keep these critters enclosed. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> this wall goes down several feet, but when the exhibit was first built without a bottom, they were soon appearing 20 feet outside the exhibit out in the desert. <laughs> well, so we had to dig it all out again and put a concrete bottom on it. Escape artists. Uh, what are they doing right now? Most of them are kind of munching uh, on grass, both green and dry, which is what they do most of the day. Some of them are gathering up uh, mouthfuls of dry hay to take underground where they're starting to build nests for, for having young. This is the breeding season. And did you plant the grass that's in here? Yes, that's winter ryegrass, which is the only grass that can stay ahead of them. They, they have such <laughs> prodigious appetites. And uh, this would be two feet high if they hadn't been eating it all winter long. Yeah, they really are cute, aren't they? They're one of the most active animals, too, so that's one of the reasons why they're such yeah. a popular exhibit. So what are you going to show me next here, Mark? Well, there's a window in this rock wall, which gives you the first glimpse into one of our habitat exhibits. Oh, this is great. A habitat exhibit is a simulation of a natural habitat with all the appropriate plants and animals exhibited together. This is a mountain habitat, and as you see here, Arizona is not all desert. We have mountain islands with pine forest on top, including all the appropriate animals that you'd expect in a pine forest. Including mountain lions, eh? Mountain lions right here in, the, in our mountains, including the desert mountains right around here plus bear and deer and turkey. All those mountain animals exist here on the islands within the desert. That's incredible. I've got to walk around and see this from the other side. Yes, there's lots more of it. So, Mark, how do you uh, go about building a mountain in the middle of the desert? Well, first, you have to build a mountain. This looks like rock, but it's really sculptured and painted concrete. Oh, why do you do that? Well, first of all, real rock is much too heavy to move in here in the quantities that we would need. Secondly, you have to sculpture it just right so that the animals are kept in their enclosures. The rock actually forms the cage. Well, you've cleverly concealed it. This looks really nice over here. Is this all uh, mountain uh, vegetation here? Yes, these are all native species, 7,000 plants, 150 species native to 4,500 to about 8,000 feet elevation. All the trees were dug up from the wild with permits, of course, and transplanted to this site. It's quite a collection and very natural and very nicely manicured. Well, we try not to make it look manicured. We try to make it look wild, but that's not so easy. Uh, outside here on the path, people go wandering around trampling things. But that's really nothing compared to what the animals do inside the enclosures. Some of the animals, anyway. Let me orient you, Bob. You can see the window up there where we first got our glimpse of the mountain lion. Oh, yeah. And you can barely see the mountain lion sleeping in the shadows up there. This is the mountain lion enclosure, and actually this is not a very good example of animal devastation. It Animals looks, uh, are... pretty nice. <laughs> it looks pretty good. Mountain lions are cats, typical cats. They sleep most of the day. They're very well behaved. They don't run around tearing up the vegetation. <laughs> so this looks pretty good. However, the next exhibit is our bear, and they're a real disaster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Bears aren't too easy on plants, huh? Bears are omnivores, which means they eat anything, and that's literally true. Oh, I see them up there. Those two little innocent fur balls <laughs> are the ones that did that to this exhibit. Was this ever landscaped? When we did it three years ago, it was fully landscaped. There was grass a foot deep. There were shrubs, beautiful things all over the place. <laughs> they totally it took them, trashed it, huh? It took them two weeks to destroy every green thing in here except the trees that are protected by electric collars. Ooh, this is pretty. Oh, this is great. The, the whole exhibit's right there to be seen. Uh, White-tailed deer and turkeys, which is exactly what you'd expect to find in a, a mountain stream bed. The only thing that's different about this exhibit is you notice that uh, there's only one shrub down there. Deer and turkey are both plant eaters, and between them there aren't very many plants they won't eat. And the, the yellow-flowered shrub down there is highly poisonous, and neither one will touch it. And that's <laughs> about the only thing that's in there. What's going on here? This is Mexican wolf, Bob, an, an endangered species. In fact, it's extinct in the United States. There are a few left in Mexico. You can see his head just uh, as he sits in the oh, bushes isn't over he there. Pretty. One of our most beautiful animals. And this is a pretty good example of wolf habitat. They're strictly carnivores, so they don't do any more damage to the vegetation than just pacing around and trampling it. And they occasionally chew on branches, but overall, this is a pretty easy exhibit to me. Better behaved than your typical dog in a backyard, right? Much better than most dogs. <laughs> well, I really like the way you blend the plantings and the artificial rock into the animal enclosures. The whole thing is just so pretty. Oh, that is a striking thing, isn't it? It's one of my favorites because of its almost perfect symmetry. This is called Desert Spoon. It's in the agave family. Mm. Looks like a starburst. That's, that's a pretty good description. And what's down in here? This is the small cat grotto exhibit. We have four species of small cats in here with a ledge of planters up on top to huh. uh, partly keeps people from falling in, but it also adds interest to just the rock work. And there's the ocelot out sunning himself. That, that's almost unheard of. It's really, <laughs> really lucky to see it out there. Boy, is that a pretty cat. What about, uh, what are these yellow fruit on these uh, This is a barrel cactus in fruit. Normally, the squirrels would eat these by, by now. This is last summer's fruit. Hmm. But uh, with the cats around, the squirrels don't come in here very often. Oh, yeah, it's pretty safe in here, huh? Definitely. Is that why all of these flowers are blooming up here? <laughs> exactly. This is gorgeous. This, this, is, a this is a slice of the desert in spring. This is one of our habitat exhibits. This is an example of what you would find a little bit farther south from here. This is Oregon pipe cactus, uh -huh. which is a little more tender. It's not quite here in Tucson. This is one of several kinds of barrel cacti that we have in the desert. This is a beautiful golden hedgehog cactus. Those These, are kind of the three main cactus, aren't they? They're three of the commonest types yeah, yeah. in the uh -huh. area. And the cacti are what you would see most of the year, including uh, the shrub here would always be here, the globe mallow. Ooh, it wouldn't always pretty. be in flower, but it's always it's here. Permanent. They're, they're perennial plants. But now what about all the wildflowers? That looks like a California poppy down there. Uh, it does. It's very closely related, but that's called Mexican poppy. It's a uh -huh. slightly more desert-adapted species. Mm. All the, what would normally be barren ground in here is covered with vegetation only in wet years. These are annual plants that come up only in favorable rainfall periods, bloom in the spring, and then die. They're not here most of the year. Mm -hmm. And this is what the whole desert would look like for mile after mile when you get those rare wet years, oh, about yeah. once in a decade. Yeah. No more than once in a decade. We have a, a far uh, wide open Mexican poppy here. Uh, these little yellow flowers are called bladder pod because the, uh, because the seed pods look like little inflated bladders. This is a lupin, just about finishing its bloom here. It's in the pea family. And this really attractive pink thing over here is called owl clover. Those are some of the commonest wildflowers that you can see in the uncommon years. Now, we're standing, this plant is right on top of the cat enclosure, right? Yes, this is the upper level where you can look down on the animals if they're out. Let's see if the bobcat can be seen here. He seems to have wandered off. We can probably get a better view of him from down below. Well, let's do that. Oh, this is great. It's a lot cooler in here when you're underground, isn't mm -hmm. it? Hey, look oh, at this. look at this. This is our jaguarundi being very cooperative for a change. Hi, it's a very secretive cat, and you almost never see them in the wild. Well, we've got a good view of it here. <laughs> Can't do any better than that. Well, let's see if we can find that uh, bobcat. Typically, you can see good views of all the animals on this lower level. There are three windows into each of these enclosures at ground level. You can usually get a good shot. Oh, there's one right there by the log. 
Uh-huh. Kind of sitting around resting as cats do most of the day. <laughs> yeah, they do a lot of sleeping, don't they? Ah, this is lovely. And a totally different look. Absolutely. This is a riparian exhibit. That is, it's a model of a riverbank forest. Huh. Look at that. You've got otters here. River there, otters. There aren't otters in Tucson, are there? Not anymore. This is an, a historical exhibit. The significance of it is that in 1880s, the Santa Cruz River flowed through Tucson looking just like this. It had permanent water. It had riverbank forests of cottonwoods and willows and otters and beavers swimming in it. Beavers? Beavers, too. You're kidding. Well, what happened to the otters and beavers in the cottonwoods? There was a climatic change, but probably at least as important was that human folly destroyed the river. We cut the trees down, we overgrazed the grassland watershed in the upstream areas, and the result today is that the river is completely dead. It's a dry channel with no vegetation, no animals. Well, that's kind of a sad lesson, but I mm -hmm. guess it's important to learn these lessons, and you can do that at the museum here. I mean, you can not only see the animals, see the flowers, but you can see their impact on our ecology and our environment. It's a mm -hmm. great story. And I can't imagine coming to Tucson without paying you a visit here. It's great. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you very much. That riparian view was absolutely beautiful. But I like the prairie dogs best of all. Now, let's head over to the suburban garden and catch up with Roger Swain. He's got a lot going on. Welcome again to the suburban garden. You know, last show, we were sawing down an elderly 75-year-old red maple that had simply become too decrepit to save. We sawed it down, saved the wood, and ground out the stump. All that's left today is a pile of wood chips and a very large hole in the landscape. If there's any consolation, it's that the additional sunlight is surely going to make this young European beach grow much faster. But Roger Cook, our landscape contractor, has convinced me that the tree is, in fact, in the wrong location. Well, I point out to him that when we planted it about 15 years ago, we didn't have a lot of choice. We put it halfway between the red maple and the house. But he says it really should be moved out. And he says that despite its considerable girth, we can dig it up and move it safely. Right, Roger? Absolutely. Listen, what have you been doing up there this morning? Oh, I've tied up all the branches so that when we back the tree spade under, and we're not going to injure any of the branches. Ah, uh -huh, the tree spade. What a piece of machinery this is. It's a beautiful is. machine. Roger Swain, Tony Capizzi, tree spade operator. Tony, how do you do? Fine. How Surely you a big yellow machine sense. like this has a name of its own. It certainly does. It's called the Big John 90. And how does it work? It's hydraulically driven, four, um, four hydraulically driven spades that I can control individually. And what it does is I can take this unit, stand it upright, retract all the spades, I'll open the gates, and then what I'll do is I'll back around the tree, uh -huh. close the gates, uh -huh set the table down, and plunge the spades into the ground. Now, how, how deep down do they go? Between four and five feet. So then you've got a good grip on this root, whole root ball. That's what do you right. do then? That's right. And then we'll lift it up. Yeah. And if we're going over the road with it, what we'll do is we'll take it and lay it right down over the truck uh -huh. the way it is right now. We'll but tie we're just the branches moving it 10 down. feet or so. That's right. So I won't have to lay it down. I'll be able to just drive a few little ways with it up in the air, not hurting the branches, and then we'll take it to its new home. This strikes me as such a, a, a labor-saving alternative to hiring a team of men hand-digging a tree. Surely everybody who moves trees now uses equipment like this. It, well, they do. Not everyone, but a few people do. How, and, how uh, many machines are there like this, you think? Oh, I'd say there's probably 100 in the country and only five in Massachusetts. Wow. Well, listen, this looks like a brand new one. It sure is. I'm going to stand back and watch it go through its paces. Okay. Now, are you worried about it? Want to, want to crush the lawn a good bit? We're already planning on replacing this lawn, so that isn't a problem with us today. If we had a very fine lawn that we wanted to save, then we would um, take and lay down plywood so he would back on plywood without damaging yeah, the lawn. spread the weight out. Right. The other aspect to look at is if we were digging this by hand, we'd have to bring in a backhoe and physically dig around the tree and then have two or three men here balling so and burlap. So you'd tear up a, a big piece of lawn yes, that way, too. Yep. Absolutely. He'll unlock it now and lower it down, and then we'll just back him in right around the center of the tree. That is something. Oh, look at that. Look at that. He's opening it right up now, and he's going to lower it down so we can just back right in. We'll center the tree right on the, the big piece of it's the It's just track. like an eggshell unfolding. Oh, 
How's that look now, Roger? That's better. That's better. A little more your weight. Okay. That's better. That's better. Straight back. Straight back. A little bit. Straight, straight back. back. Straight back. Straight back. Straight back. Straight back. A little, little more. A 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 little more. No. A little. Why don't you take a, a look at it now? Yeah, okay. take a look at it. I think he wants a little more. I want to line up with these pins here. You want to be a little. You want to come back a little about three more. Inches, on that, three inches, three, four inches. But you tell us. Okay, let me close it up and we can make the adjustments. He's going to close it up, Roger, and uh, take a look at it. All right. That's pretty good. I might have to pull forward a little bit, Roger. Oh, whoa. Right there. Okay, Roger, that looks pretty good. We're all What's set. next? Now we're going to level the unit so when Tony picks it up, he picks the tree up straight. When we put it in the hole, it sits straight. Makes sense. Okay, Roger. All plumb and all plumb and all level. Let's Ready go. to go. All right, now as I understand it, spades all set up. Four of the biggest shovels I have ever seen are about to plunge down into New England ground. Now, you gentlemen know, none of us have any idea what's under this grass. Exactly. I figure this is where the fun begins. Well, let's see what happens. OK. When he sinks his blades, he's going to sink what he calls his number one and then his number three. Sinks them in opposite fashion to get maximum down pressure on the blade. Then he'll go two and four. They, they don't all go down at once. Uh -huh. Well, that's one advantage of individual control. You can see he got this first spade in about two feet. You can generally tell how good things are going by the look on the operator's face. There's a scrow. We know we've had problems. Well, I hear a certain grinding of rocks down in there. Well, the grinding of the rocks doesn't bother us so much. It's when the spade stops. That's when we have a problem. He'll work these and work them until we get all four of them sunk to the maximum all the way around the tree. A little at a time, it's slow progress, but we'll get there. It's certainly easier than standing on a shovel. A big foot here. Looks like you hit some rocks down there, Roger. Well, I'm a little concerned. It's not going in as slick as I would like to see. Um, we're going to try and work the blades in and see if we can get by some of these bigger rocks underneath. It's, you just never know what's under the ground. Um, unfortunately, we have no prior knowledge, but we're going to keep working at it and see if we can get the blade sunk down. This is New England, after all. When they first designed these, they designed them for nurseries out in the uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and in that area where they have a real sandy clay loom type of base. We've tried to adapt them to New England conditions. Now, what were the adaptions? Narrower blades, or? Narrower blades, and even some of these stabilizers on the back side to help the blade go in straight with all the rocks. What we're going to do is we're going to take and dig down next to the blades and see if there's one large rock stopping the blade. If there is, I'll go in and dig it out of the way so we can keep Free going the blade down. To keep going down. Right, typical New England soil. You just don't know, okay, what we're going to hit. We're going to find out right now. Anything you dig up on the outside of the ball would be lost anyway. That's so right. It's, it's not going to do anything to the tree itself. Yeah. Well, there's one rock down there. I can hear it. Hey, well, cheer up, Roger. I mean, it's pouring down rain, and yes, you had to get a backhoe in to move those rocks that were catching the blades, but it looks to me like we're making progress. I knew as soon as we turned the TV cameras on, something like this would happen. But it's coming out. Hey, look at that. Now what's he going to do? We're going to lift it up, get up above the ground, tip it back over the machine for stability. We're going to drive it out. We're going to back in, dig our hole, and put it right in the hole. This rain is excellent. This root ball just stays compressed between the blades, which is the nice thing about it. There's no jiggling of it at all. Well, at long last, Roger, a chance to put the tree where we probably should have put it in the first place. I think right about here is where I would like to see it. I think that's perfect. That's about 20 feet from its previous location. 
but it'll be beautifully centered on the door. And also far enough away from our perimeter, we'll never have a problem with branches overhanging. Good. Well, let's do it. Dan, right here. Still a good supply. We've got maple roots down there, isn't there? Unbelievable what they've done, isn't it? We're fortunate that it's a red maple and not a red oak or something to that nature. Got a shallower root system. Yep. It'll take a few minutes to pop through them, but then we should be all right. Back it up. Come on in, come on in. Tony's going to lift it up in the air now. We're going to lower it into the hole. Now, this hole is the same depth. Same as the exact root depth as the other one, yes. So the bottom of the tree will be sitting on, on parent earth, so to speak. It's going to be sitting on the same type of soil it was in its original Good. hole. And Good. that way, it'll be acclimated here the same as it was in its Good. original hole. It's going to be a little higher than it was. Uh, but I think it's better higher than low. Just keep flowing. It's got to come all the way around this side. Well, it's all backfilled then, Roger, huh? Yeah, we're all ready for Tony to start pulling the spades out of the ground now. All right. Go ahead, Tony. You can see the whole key is just getting enough material around it so that ball just stays right where we put it. Isn't that nice? Now, when the spades are all the way out, we, we do a little bit of backfilling, just tap, tamp it down firmly. What we there. always do is this edge or the tree will be lifted up a little. We'll take and lay that down and then tamp down again and make a ring around it and flood the whole tree. We're also going to put cables on it today. Hey, I think you're right, Roger. The tree looks a lot better here than it did over by the house. I sure hope so. But by the time we're done and cleaned up, I think it'll be just gorgeous. Hey, while well, you finish cutting the branches loose and putting in the guy wires, I'm off to the vegetable garden for a few minutes. In my experience, we gardeners tend to jump the gun indoors, starting our peppers and tomato seedlings a little too early. But outdoors, on the other hand, we tend to be a little late. We forget just how many things will grow beautifully outdoors in this kind of weather. Take the stuff in this cold frame, for example. Now, in the past, We've had our cold frames glazed with a sheet of polyethylene film, but that breaks down in sunlight, and we had to replace it every year, and we hated to throw away that much plastic. So this year, we've glazed it with a piece of professional greenhouse glazing. It's a polycarbonate, guaranteed to last 10 years or more. Look what we've got inside. A lovely stand of young beet transplants. Now, this beet is Little Egypt. It's a beet designed for transplanting. Not all beets transplant very well. These are flats. Peas. They've been sown individual peat strips. They'll be up in a few days and out in the garden. Now let's see how these are doing. Ah, oh, yes. Look at our cabbages. Aren't those nice? And here's some radicchio and some lettuce. And oh, look, the fava beans are just up. Well, fava beans can take a great deal of cold. I can put them outdoors any day now. Well, you don't have to have a cold frame to grow things outdoors this time of year. I've got some spinach planted last fall and overwintered under a sheet of polyester, spun bonded polyester fabric. We've done this before. Look at those spinach plants. Those were planted last fall have come along nicely despite the fact it was bitterly cold and we had very little snow cover, very little burn. This plant will grow up like that and be ready to eat in just a few weeks. But we've grown spinach here at the Suburban Garden before. But let me show you something we haven't. It's brand new. This may not look very impressive. These are lettuce plants, sown by seed in the garden in September, they germinated, they've held over in the winter. They'll grow up good size heads, like any other lettuce. It's a variety called North Pole. Don't try this with just any lettuce. But North Pole has come through with flying colors. Well, there's one vegetable here that is the oldest vegetable we harvest year after year. Leeks planted sometime last year grown all summer long in the fall mulched with a thick layer of salt marsh hay and let's see how they've come through the winter it can take an amazing amount of cold just get in underneath that dig it up oh isn't that nice and just get that cleaned up give it to marion it's a cook's delight forgive the pun but what's hotter than grilled vegetables? And what's trendier than leeks?
Today I'm going to grill some leeks, but first I have to prepare them. The first thing is to take off the dark green top, and then I have to pare off the root a little bit. And I'm going to do that rather carefully because I don't want all the leaves to stay intact. That will take care of it. And then one slice down the side, which will help to open up the leaves because there's a lot of sand that gets in there while they're growing. And I don't want a gritty leaf. Once that's plunged in out of water, it should be nice and clean, and that'll be ready for the grill. I'm gonna cook my leeks on a covered grill. If you have a cover on yours, use exactly the same method, but just take a little longer. The first thing I have to do is to roll the leeks in a little bit of oil so they won't stick on the grill. And I put the seam side up. Now, as long as I'm grilling the leeks, I might as well add some salmon. They'll cook in just about the same amount of time. Okay, I've let these cook about eight minutes on one side. Now I've turned them all and they'll cook for about six minutes more on the other. Ah. Just look at those grilled leeks and salmon. Low-cal, elegant, and easy. Great, Marion. Just great. Well, that's our show for today, folks, and I'm glad you could join me. And I hope you'll be back next time when Jim Wilson is joined by landscape architect Tom Worth to show off some big changes at the Victory Garden South. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants, available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. And by Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Osmocote time-release plant foods for all your outdoor and indoor plants. Now, home improvement is easy with helpful hints from Dean Johnson and Joanne Liebler. From useful decorating tips to advice for the dedicated do-it-yourselfers, spend some time with the hosts of Home Time, next on KCET.